Do you have plans as mayor to use your position to establish an energy strategy for residents, businesses, and the city? If so, how would you do it? And if not, why not? Uh, I would create a special assistant to the mayor whose main focus in working with our uh, DECD uh, commissioner would be to look at opportunities not only here in, in government, but also within our Board of Education, within uh, the community, within businesses. Uh, look at uh, creating those uh, standards and helping uh, where we can to, from an incentive perspective to making sure that people who are, are moving forward, be it LED lights, uh, be it weatherization and things of that nature, that the city is participating along with any state or federal uh, opportunities that are there. If we can get a good return on investment, I'm ready to accelerate and put more bonding out for anything that we can get a good return on investment. And incidentally, yes, we've already had conversations about how we can improve energy efficiency within the homes and in the commercial establishments. That was part of our LEED standards. I want to push that and move that forward. And that's a really tough thing to do. But clearly, we're going to latch on to what CLNP is doing and some of the programs they're offering and make that more available, more accessible, and educate people about those opportunities. What I would expect that when we look at new buildings, if we're going to be looking at a new school, we would actually make sure that we look at doing putting geothermal. And it's used all over the Northeast and a lot of um, municipal as well as hospitals. I think in terms of when we were going to look at these schools, there's so many, pro the school's infrastructure has been just uh, ignored for years and years and years, but the windows, there's big payback and efficiencies with the windows and, and the uh, fixing the roofs. So I think if we can, and there's very good money available to actually um, pay for those, or help pay for those investments. My energy efficient with Stanford Public Schools that I pulled up, we are saving money. We are saving, 17 million kilowatts of changing light bulbs. A lot of things in the school system do. $51 million, we're saving them instead of throwing it out the window. If the new buildings are being built in the city of Stanford, anything new being built, I want to see what we're going to do and put in to the building specs energy, energy efficient. What, what light bulbs are we using? What windows are we using? They are doing it now, but I want to make sure we give green rooftops, solar panels, for power, heat, geothermal is correct. I'm totally for that. Different neighborhoods have different environmental issues. These include contaminated well water in the north and proximity to the sewage treatment plant in the south. What should be the city's role in addressing neighborhood environmental issues and which issues specifically will you prioritize as mayor? Right now, we have a well water testing program. And that well water testing program, I want to accelerate. There are about 750 to or more people who are on a waiting list on that well water testing program. And that's a great program because we find more contaminated wells and it is, and is at a very much lower cost than if people were to go out and do it themselves. So one of the things I'm going to do is push that program and accelerate it. But it doesn't take any more priority than the odor control issues that are at the WPCA. And quite frankly, even, and just as importantly, is that we've started having sewage dumping into Long Island Sound from our WPCA. I mean, that's got to have the same priority as drinking well water. It's not as if we can say one's more important than the other. They're both important. And I would add third is, as I mentioned earlier, I'd pushed for years for single stream recycling. In some neighborhoods, the single stream recycling is very strong. But in other neighborhoods, it's very little. And somehow we're going to have to work to educate the people in those neighborhoods and get that recycling rate up. I would not be prioritizing by the neighborhood. By, uh, certainly I would continue following through. I've been very active with the WPCA in terms of trying to get um, not only their financial uh, house in order, but to get them to just fix the plant. The plant was never really operating properly, even from when it was put in, a $100 million investment, it was never operating properly and they do have, by, they're running their bypass too often and affecting the sound. I think though the cities are going to be priority, the priority is going to be, has already been set for the city in a lot of ways. We're under a mandate to put in for the new permitting process. We've got to have a very significant investment that's going to be, have to be made for the, for this, really for the storm runoff. It's got to be collected. Um, almost none of it's going to be able to just go into the sound and it's got to be a lot of testing, regular testing on all the storm drains and it's going to be a very rigorous um, and expensive pro proposition for us to really assess where we stand in terms of the runoff, the types of runoff, and to prevent um, you know, the, cont the contamination that comes from that runoff. I'm going to have to disagree with the last two.
candidates. I was at WPCA. Again, I'm a plumber. I walked through, I was one of the first candidates to walk through the place. We have sewer pipes all the way down five feet. I was down five feet. There's rotted supporters down there. They caught it. If they didn't catch it, big time trouble. There's more to it, my time's gonna be short. They actually got what they call scrubbers. You remember the smell that we used to have? That was really bad down there? Well, guess what? The gentleman there now got the scrubbers working. Why? Because they had a coarse, fine scrubbers in there. They're fine scrubbers. So what the scrubbers does is recycle the, the war, our sewage water, plus freshen our air, goes through the recycling ducts. We also have our raw sewage. Goes into a, another style of a plant that gets converted, converted up to another drying process, like a big dryer. They're taking our raw sewage, and everybody thinks we're hauling it away. That's more money. They're making up pellets. They sell these pellets to farms out of the state of Connecticut. Folks, WPCA is 100% better. I'm totally for them. Anybody got any rejections against them? You're totally wrong. There is no specific priority. Everything has the same priority when we're talking about the health and safety of our citizens and, and our neighborhoods. Um, you know, I support the MS4 program with Kathleen, Kathleen talked about, which is a program that the city is currently into or looking at, which is uh, monitoring the runoff and water and the storm drains, because that doesn't go through the WPCA. Uh, unfortunately, right now, the do some of the dollars uh, to implement that, uh, that uh, are needed are being held hostage in the Board of Finance, uh, a position that Mr. Martin and Kathleen both uh, sit on. With respect to WPCA, I'm not a plumber, but I did go down there too and looked at it and it's it, you know they've got it they're getting it together there but it's been years and years of neglect years and years of neglect and not only under these past four years but under the prior administration something was not right there and what john mentions about rusting pipes about uh, buying scrubbers that aren't working and so on we need to take a look at that we cannot afford to have problems in systems as important as that is in the city of stanford Stanford has a lively range of citizen-led boards and commissions that set direction for the city departments that implement environmental policies. These include environmental protection, land use, parks, planning, and zoning. As mayor, what will be your vision for these boards and departments in setting policy and making decisions on environmental issues? I would not be appointing just or agreeing to appointments of just um, political cronies. We need people who really care and who then absolutely will uh, understand and enforce um, the regulations that and address the, uh, and particularly in the land use area, but in every area, we'd have to make sure that the, um, the boards understood what their responsibilities were. And we can, they cannot be influenced with big money. I think the, uh, they do need to have counsel frequently that they would be able to ask questions of who would be, um, would be somewhat of an expert in that area, that the area that they're addressing in terms of what the master plan says, what the uh, uh, Connecticut general statutes say, so that we don't have the violations um, that sometimes occur because people are just a little complacent and not, not really aware of that there are some other constraints on some of these uh, development plans that come in front of them. So I would make sure that we have very competent people, we give them a great orientation in terms of their responsibility, and. Um, as I said, balanced in terms of the needs of the city, understand the needs of the city, but more importantly, to follow their obligations and duty um, on that board. How I see it, I think the boards need to be cleaned up. Time for new people in there, new blood. Guaranteed new blood. There's a lot of other things, but we're talking about the health department. Health department, they need uh, to be more educated. Let them get educated more so we can do our inspections on our environment. Uh, you got the beaches, shell beds, who goes clamming, <clears throat> follow the permits on some of them. If we need more inspectors out there, I'm leaving the boards, I'm going to the inspectors. We need inspectors out here for the city of Stanford. Illegal clamming, lobstering, West Beach, all the beaches that we have, Cove Beach. We need inspectors out there walking through the bird sanctuary, who's doing what over there checking the beds, see if we get any pollutions. I want to make a statement. There tends, tends to be a, a situation where we think that there's cronyism and theft and people are getting paid off on our boards. And these are volunteer 
citizens in our city in most cases that do a very good job and take the time out of their life to be part of the city. So I'd like to thank them, number one. Number two, there are obviously always going to be issues. But I think in a Fidelity administration, and it doesn't just go for environmental boards, all boards, I'm going to seek out the best people in our city who want to participate, who have a shared vision of where we're going as a city, be it environmental, be it housing, zoning, and things of that nature, to make sure that they represent all of our constituency, the demographics of who we are, to making sure that they represent not only the city in their decisions, but also you, the citizens, in the decisions that uh, need to be made. And I think it's important to pick on that talent. We have a lot of great talent in the city. We need to get them out of being spectators and being part of the solution. And the Fidelity administration, we will seek those people out and make sure that they're part of the solution. When I was president of the Board of Reps, we had more than a dozen committees, and I had to figure out how to appoint the 39 other members of our board to those committees. And I can tell you my guidelines are as I wanted the best people on each of those committees. I had 39 to work with, but I wanted the best people and those who were committed to work. I wanted diversity, and not just diversity in terms of where they came from or, which, or, or balancing Republicans and Democrats. I wanted diverse points of view. I deliberately appointed the person who was most in favor of development and the person who was most opposed to development on the land use board. And I wanted them to work with others to get things, get things done. And that's my goal. But there is another important part here. And I think your question is something that I've been thinking about. My vision of Stanford is the green city that fully integrates environmental thinking and planning to all of its decision making. And right now, we have all these different boards. And with the exception of the Environmental Protection Board, which has it in its title, not very many boards are truly thinking about these issues. And somehow, how can we instill that thinking throughout all these things? And it's a problem that I'm working on to try to figure out a better way to get more thinking across all of those many disparate boards you mentioned. There has been disagreement about the harbor, marinas, process, and funding. Setting aside issues associated with Harbor Point for the purpose of this debate on the environment, what is your vision for Stanford's waterfront, an area that extends from Dolphin Cove to Cove Island? What do you want to see in terms of environmental quality, public access, and development for the unique resource <coughs> of Stanford's waterfront? Stanford has a great coastline. Our boatyard that we're missing, we need that boatyard back. Used to come going in and out of the harbor and watching the big boats coming in, who's coming in from Long Island, who's coming in and doing this way. The gas dock, we don't have a gas dock. We had to come all the way down to between West Beach and Cummings Beach to get to a gas dock. We need another gas dock out there for folks that are coming from Manhattan, coming by, or coming from Florida and going to Maine or Massachusetts. There's a lot of people who travel the waterway. Our waterway is great. Schofield Town Park, that needs serious help. And I can get some serious donation in my cabinet. That park needs to be dredged. I remember going down there fishing for snapper fishing, having fun. Now the docks are up, the mud's in there, and you look across the way and our boatyard's missing. Our shoreline is a very important asset to our city, and I believe it's one we need to protect and preserve. But I also believe that we have to give our citizens more access to it. There are some parts of the property, you know, uh, John spoke about the, the boatyard. Uh, unless you were a brewer's customer, you couldn't go and walk out on that 14-acre peninsula and use it, besides it being con contaminated with arsenic and lead, copper that was leaching into the sound. But be that as it may, that's why, to your earlier point about our boards, our coastal management boards, our zoning land use boards, we need to put people in there who are going to maintain that, to make sure that we have people. It works, folks, and if you don't believe it, there's a building down there, and if we're talking about the South End coastline, called Pitney Bowes, which unfortunately won't be called that probably in the near future. But that was part of the coastal management project. Uh, that was a building that was built through that process uh, to be on the water. Now, it happens to be on the other side of the controversial issue. But if you walked into that building, you will see in the large atrium some very large stones that look out of place. Those were there because of the conditions that were placed on from the coastal management in preserving that thing. So it can work if you got the right boards in place. Thank you. Again, turning to when I was president of the Board of Reps, we created, the first time, the Harbor Management Commission. That's uh, something I did early in my presidency. And basically to give more local control over our harbor and not have the state dictate terms. And, that, and then later on, I had to work because we were, get, we were slow in getting a harbor management plan and issues were developing. But quite frankly, they resolved those, we resolved them. And it's something that I think contributes. But it is inward looking. It is, for the first time, we're taking a look and starting to think about how our dredging and everything works. My vision is that we also need to look outward. 
The Sound is Connecticut's most valuable natural resource. I mean, not Indian casinos, it's the Sound. And we don't really connect to the Sound the way Mystic does or the way uh, Norwalk has begun to do. And Sound Water has begun to make a connection, but that's the question. Can we kind of make more of a connection to the Sound where people from outside of Stanford want to come into Stanford Harbor for part of our entertainment and sort of the heritage and history of Stanford? And, and that's what I'd like to see us begin to address. Number one, I do want to clear, some, clear something up. The, the uh, south end where the, the boatyard, the controversy, if you will say, the, uh, whoever did the negotiations actually did a good job because they, the responsibility first on Terry's and then BLT in their footsteps was to clean up. It was environmentally a mess. They were given developmental rights in, and extra the ability to make a more profit on the, ba on the balance of their, uh, the property that they own by doing their cleanup. I think that, um, that is critical. Uh, it, that's already part of, that's part of our deal with Antares for them to clean up whether the boat yard is there or not. The boat yard should be there. Public access, the city says there's public access. When you put a large building there and then you say that they can walk around it, we have public access throughout the city and include, let's say where Starwoods is. When you, those buildings look like they're private and they're not, and you don't, you feel like you're trans, trespassing when you decide you're gonna go on it. So we really do have to, that does, should not count for, for uh, I don't think it should count for at public access. What is your vision for funding and maintaining parks overall and by neighborhood? And what is your plan to make this happen? I think we need to maintain them and keep them. Uh, one of the plans under the Fidelity administration would be to complete and build the Schofield Town Park. I was at the meeting, I guess about a week, week and a half ago, where alternatives and we're moving forward. And for too long, the residents of Schofield Town Park have had a start, stop, start, stop. And the Fidelity administration, we're going to make sure that park gets completed and serves, serves that neighborhood. Uh, I look forward to uh, implementing and working on the plan of Cummings Park to, to make the improvements that uh, we're talking about there, kind of very similar to the phase one plans that were done at uh, Schofield. Uh, uh, not Schofield Park, I'm sorry, um, Scalzi Park. And uh, I think everybody's been there, you've seen the improvements, and that was a phase two project. So in a Fidelity administration, we'll do that. And I think there's also an opportunity as we uh, develop and do things uh, throughout our community uh, to build new parks, uh, to create more open space, uh, to uh, get with the zoning boards to make sure that that is a component and a priority in what we do. Well, first of all, I was a big supporter of the transformation of Mill River Park. And when you think about the environment and the storms that have come, uh, for all of the expense, and it has been expensive, don't, don't think that it hasn't been. We have saved more money in the last three storms because it not a single time has it flooded. And the insurance rates for the, those areas are going down while the insurance rates in a lot of other places are going up because of the threat of storms. We have saved more money in that alone. But I was a strong supporter of that. I was attacked for that. But I see what we see when it's coming to fruition. I actually see the city as having five diamonds. There are Sound Waters, there are the Mill River Collaborative, the Museum and Nature Center, the Arboretum, and it's the city. The city and its cove, Cummings and Scalzi. And somehow I want to pull together a vision about all of these natural resources that reach out to so many people that make this city more than just a city of corporate 500, head, a corporate, uh, Fortune 500 headquarters. It's a city with a soul and a human side as well for the people that live here and for the kids that play here. Part of the reason I think that the city hasn't been able to maintain or even complete uh, some of the projects they start in, the, in these various parks across the city is because of the financial mismanagement. So the budget process, we've got to get our, our house in order and fix the foundation so that we set priorities and, and make sure that money is spent not only on, on the parks, but on all of, a lot of different infrastructure projects that have really been let go for over a, over a decade. I think the, a lot of the park areas, I, we just sacrifice parks. Again, if we go back to the 205 McGee Avenue, that's a park. We are entitled to some money from the state when we dedicate it as a park. We're not putting it on the zoning uh, records as a park because now they want to you know, use it in this, uh, as a boat yard. For, uh, we've got to, when, we just, when we determine there's a park property, we need to preserve it. There's very good rules and regulations, zoning rules and regulations, to keep that park as a park. But again, as soon as there's money involved, we seem to uh, let money speak. All the parks need to be redone. Which phase one, which is phase two is being covered up. Cummings Beach needs to be redone. 
Definitely. We need to uh, redo the snack bar where you take a shower, change clothes. That's older than me. That has to be redone also. But all the, all the parks, Cove Beach is, came great. Cove Beach needs, they got choked up a little bit before. I'd like to see a fence from the dam all the way across. Three foot fence, four foot fence with a sign on it. So kids don't walk down there and we don't have another accident. Stanford doesn't need that. Chestnut Hill Park, Dorothy Heroy, all the way up the line, that needs to be redone. I went to, I went to Tyson Center, had a day camp there. I went there. All the parks need to be redone. In Mill Park, I think that was an overkill. Definitely was an overkill. We don't even need the Trump building there either. As mayor, what specific actions would you take to promote environmental education and environmental initiatives among the youth in Stanford? One of the things I'm going to do as a mayor is attend those Board of Educations in dialogue, in collaboration with them, and that's one of the things that I think we can do. I think we can develop uh, not only science programs that are focused on environmental um, issues in the high schools, but also can we coordinate some science um, uh, programs in the elementary schools that can be tied to uh, visits that go to Sound Waters, again, one of our five diamonds, or the Museum and Nature Center. We frequently have programs integrating with those. Do we have it in it? Is it just a, is it just a, um, a field trip? And they go around and have fun for a day? Or are we going to integrate that back into our science training in the elementary schools? And I think that's something that we can do. Field trips should be more than just a fun day. They should be an educational opportunity. Uh, more recently, I know there's a lot of activity in our Stanford schools in terms of teach, having the kids really understand the importance of recycling and what it means for the planet, planet Earth. And then you can't go in any schoolroom where they're not talking about recycling. So certainly I think on the, um, what we need to do in terms of the, uh, the waterfront and the Long Island Sound, I think educating with what you're doing, certainly with the children bringing them out on the uh, on the schooner and in other programs, and UConn has programs as well, summer programs, when they're educating children using their agricultural program in terms of the, really the importance of nature and of the, um, and really taking care of the environment for future generations. I'm hoping those kids will be, will be educating the parents, us adults in this room. Well, the Student Conservation Association has a very good program. It is online, and I'm definitely gonna back that up is very good. Teaching our kids about the environment and about the water, the sound waters and all. I'm, I'm praying that and in my becoming a mayor and my team, I'm going to have a nice down at the boatyard, have a boatyard back there, but also have a type of school, a, uh, a volunteer thing, so kids can come down there and see what we have. Action speaks louder than, than words. In late 90s, and I was a representative for the 147th District. If you remember, the Ag Center at uh, West Hill High School was a, basically a little shack uh, near the football field. And I got involved with a gentleman by the name of Ben Katita at the time and Marion Gloka, and we fought hard for dollars to build an Ag Center uh, at West Hill High School uh, for not only agriculture, but for aquaculture, an understanding of the environment, hydroponics, and all those things. Uh, I was very proud to see that the dollars did get allocated under my administration. Unfortunately, I wasn't in office at the time, and the administration in this city at the time didn't feel it was important to put my name on the plaque uh, that went there. I was also very proud to be part of uh, the acquisition, or actually the transfer, of the Bartlett Arboretum from Yukon to the city of Stanford, because it is a Stanford asset, as Mr. Martin said, and I was very proud to be part of the legislators who made that transfer for the city. There are some challenges there, and hopefully as mayor, I can help them through those challenges. Making cities more livable is a priority throughout the country. The next mayor of Stanford faces some tough challenges that go to the core of what keeps our city livable, such as reducing traffic, improving access in and around Stanford. Have you considered transit ideas such as light rail, bike lanes, the bus system, or others? If so, what are your ideas and what are your plans to implement them? Well, traffic here we know is, is a big problem. It, they're all of the, I mean, you need to really have done a lot of planning before we got into this mess where as I said it's really affecting the quality of life and I think it also affects our economic development even in attracting um, businesses because of the, the congestion that's in the city. I think the, um, the, there, is a there has been study on the light rail. I think the, uh, was 
I looked at it, and uh, the, basically the conclusion was that it was very expensive operations, and it was just it wasn't really going to do the job of connecting uh, the city the way it was expect. You know that we had they had hoped when they put that did that study. The um, obviously encouraging if we had very if much more if we had better uh, services on the buses and if the tra if we could get people onto the buses. But so that's a little bit of a double-edged sword. But I do think the inter intercity. Um, bus routes would actually help alleviate. And I think those shuttle buses that are running back and forth from the transit station about down to the south end, and that bus, which we supported uh, BLT on, that should be running, and it, I understand that it's not yet, but it should be running up to the city as well. So we're moving a lot of people on shuttle buses that are, can be a little more, um, react a little faster to people's needs, because we're not very patient people waiting on, the, uh, waiting on, a, on a bus. Our Stanford transportation, we need to get the lights all organized. My candidates all know that already. We've been up and down this already. Uh, I don't know, BLT has a little trolley system they're working on. It looks pretty good. They use it up in Lake George trolley system, driving a little trolley, driving around, moving people around a little faster. We need signs put up, up on our signal signs. Stanford got a good signal department, good sign guys. They can hang signs divert people which way they gotta go. You come to an intersection, sometimes you don't know which way you're going. The traffic department, the guys are out 4.30 in the morning, painting the lines best they could. We got 365 miles of blacktop out here. These guys are out hustling, trying not to get run over by cars in the morning to mark the streets, to mark the roads for us. If we can get the signs organized in Myrtle Avenue, that's gonna be another disaster going on. We have big problems with the traffic. We all know that here. I found out that, I guess, at some point in our lifetime, we got rid of a traffic engineer here in the city of Stamford, and uh, we need a plan to uh, look at intermodal needs. Uh, intermodal needs aren't just light rail, they're you know, bike paths, uh, sm short, shorter, smaller buses with higher frequency, uh, uh, safe sidewalks, uh, lighting signalization, all those, and unfortunately we've done it piecemeal. We've done it piecemeal because we don't have the direction there, and Fidelity administration We'll take a look at all those opportunities uh, for the intermodal component, make it part of the planning process, bring the talents in uh, to make sure that we're looking at that. This is, you know, this was not cre created overnight, it's not going to be fixed overnight, but I think if we look at it as part of our plan whenever we're looking at either development or improving our streetscapes and, and sidewalks, I think we then can try to start moving this in the right direction so that the issues relating to traffic uh, can be looked at. I believe there are 42 different point-to-point -point shuttles that are going in and out of our transportation center. Four years ago, I suggested at this debate um, that we should probably figure out a way to provide a better public transit system within the downtown area and down to the south end where you don't need 42 shuttles. You can actually have better service and make the city more affordable by building a new site type of system. But unfortunately, we didn't go that way. And in fact, the first thing that happened when the administration came in is they got rid of our transportation planner. That's when it disappeared. And quite frankly, we need transportation planning, no question about it. And I am going to bring that transportation planner back to do the timing of the lights and to work on the public transit and to, and to do all these other things. The only two other things I'll say in my time is I am already a member of People Friendly Stanford whose mission is to make the streets of Stanford more friendly to bicyclists and pedestrians. And secondly, one of my plans is, in addition to all else, in addition to a mayor's car, there's going to be a mayor's bicycle. And at some risk to the life of the mayor, I will bike from the government center <laughs> to the downtown, the east side, the west side, the south side, because that's the direction we need to go. Following Irene and Sandy, the issue of rising sea level turned from the abstract to the practical as residents and businesses suffered huge inconveniences and loss of income. Given that Stanford is vulnerable, both because of our location on the water and our many trees throughout the city, what will be your plans as mayor on issues such as protecting our coastlines, tree maintenance, and having a more resilient power grid? The trees gotta be trimmed. If you see a tree leaning and all, Give the town a call. We're short in the tree division, but again, that's another subject. There's a lot of things we can do. There could be check valves installed in some of our sewer drains down near Chapin, down near the cove. It goes directly from our water, street water, goes out to the sound. We could put a check valve in them, and we, which we could. That could stop this, the rising water coming up and popping the seawater coming up over. 
that's a very hard thing. We have a storm coming, I'm repeating myself, but you can't raise the storm rope, you can't raise the property up. There's no way we're gonna be able to do that. I wanna get a alarm system or something that we can get to the folks we have it. I wanna make it work. Other towns have it. When there's a storm coming, get an evacuation route, get a thing working, get the city workers, police department, even me as a mayor, I'll be out there working with these guys. I'm not even the mayor, I'm a public citizen, and I'm out there helping these guys. As Lieutenant Governor, I was a member of the emergency management team in the state of Connecticut, three and a half million citizens. We, channeled, we handled hurricanes, floods, snowstorms, unfortunate disasters with uh, gas explosions and things of that nature. I know storm management. I know response, recovery, and the new term, resiliency. What, what do you do after you've come back up? How do you now protect yourself from that 100-year-old storm. So I can tell you, I've done it at a th with three and a half million uh, folks population, moving large organizations as a state police, National Guard, state public works, in coordination with cities. I've been there, I've done it. Again, action over words. Uh, as mayor, I will just take that talent and move forward. But I think the piece that I bring is to build on the resiliency. Look at microgrids, uh, as we're looking at in the EDI project down at Government Center, to tie corporations and other folks to these microgrids. Look at the fuel cell technology and see where that's going to take us. So I'm going to weigh as much on the re recovery and response as I am on the resiliency as we rebuild our systems. And God forbid we have another one of these storms that will protect us over these hundred years. Well, of course we're going to do emergency planning, but I think the question is not only emergency planning, but the long-term planning to mitigate the damage from these storms, and they're becoming more frequent. Uh, something we've got to do is we've actually got to do a major study, and I think this is a regional study, something that perhaps SWERPA can do, a regional study to understand how these storms are going to impact our coastline, not just in um, Stanford, but across the whole lower Fairfield County. And that affects for us it has the, the flooding areas. Where is the flooding going to change, and how is flood insurance going to change, and how is our land use going to have to change? There's a lot of things going on there. More specifically, some of the things that we can do is, for instance, we can start putting in um, dunes, artificial, sort of semi-artificial dunes to help protect our parks. The last Sandy Storm cost us five to six million dollars to repair the damage to our parks, and we're not done yet. And so we need to start thinking about how to do that. The Energy Improvement District, which was something that we created when I was president of the Board of Reps, and it's been slowed down, but basically we need to create a separate uh, local power grid that we can do to make certain that we can maintain power when we have these storms. And finally, we need to solarize. Solar energy is becoming economic, and so we need to solarize even at the residential level, and it's something that we can help push forward. Well, I, I actually uh, do live down in the Chopin area, and I have to say my respect for Mother Nature and that sea is, uh, is greatly increased, in the la both between Irene and Sandy. We've had tremendous damage down there. Fortunately, under the new building codes, and as I, I referenced, I, we built a new home, we were required to build it up. The water flows through our basement, and now all, in, all of the houses um, are looking at ra being raised in that area, because again, there's significant damage. There are. Uh, three houses in our block that are actually not even uh, occupied yet. They're not repaired yet. So what I think we need to do, and the answer, you know, obviously whoever put the hurricane barrier in was, they had a lot of, uh, that was very smart and it protected us. I think we should never be allowed to be building outside of that hurricane barrier because evacuation is going to be very difficult and sending in emergency responders would be very difficult and getting people off of uh, the south end will be, would be very difficult with adding too many people, uh, another 2,000 people or plus. I think in terms of our power lines, I would love to see when we open up streets to start putting them underground. They're an eyesore to start with, and uh, in most countries, even in Europe, they are, they're underground.